So good evening, everyone. Welcome to oh, maybe one or two people who I don't recognize. So welcome here for our Wednesday night Dharma talk. Um, this Dharma talk uh, always comes up every December. It is my annual Buddha's Enlightenment Day Dharma talk. We actually, Buddha's Enlightenment Day was uh, last uh, last week on Thursday, December 8th. And of course, we call December 8th Buddha's Enlightenment Day, but already we have to bring get great doubt to this whole story because December 8th is actually not the date of Buddha's Enlightenment Day. Buddha's Enlightenment Day is supposedly the eighth day of the last month. So when Japan changed to a Western calendar, suddenly Buddha's Enlightenment Day was December 8th. But actually, it would be more like sometime in January or February on the um, lunar calendar. And many of the Buddhist communities in this world celebrate Vesak Day in May which is Buddha's Enlightenment Day, his birthday on the same day. So actually, it's important to start off this discussion recognizing that it's all fantasy. We really don't know. And how often we forget that basic point. We so crave to know that we forget that we don't know. And in many ways, the simple practice that we have in, in Zen and probably in Buddhism in general is oriented towards becoming a little bit more comfortable with not knowing. And I'm, I'm saying it as a little bit more comfortable I'm trying to move us in gradations because our minds so easily go to binary systems. We either have it or we don't have it. And I think that basic tendency is fundamentally so deep, so strong in our consciousness, and it throws us off because we 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 miss so much of the subtlety and the gradation of life. You know, in different countries, different monastics wear different colors. And in Korea, they wear gray. Now, I have to admit, I don't think anybody has ever explained to me the reason why Korean monastics wear gray robes. But for me, the grayness of it is a kind of inclusion of everything. It's not binary. If, you know, if we were at the Zen Center right now and everybody was wearing their robes, each one of us would have a distinct gray that's different than every other gray. So to say it's gray is true in the widest sense, but the closer you look, the less true it is. And gray, at least in my understanding, is a, is, is a blending of black and white. In a sense, it's a blending of all things. So in Korean-style Buddhism, we start with gradation. And what I'm really trying to say here is that our minds are so binary that it, we miss gradation. We're always looking for the, for the answer that will satisfy our anxiety. But it never works because it's never the right answer. There is no right answer. Every moment is a new moment. And yeah, we get some benefit of the experience that we've gleaned from before, but right now it's a different moment. So I don't often like to talk about these things, but um, my 30 year anniversary of being a teacher of Zen in the quantum school of Zen 
what happened two weeks ago. It was December 2nd. On December 2nd, 1992, I had my Inca ceremony uh, at the Providence Zen Center. And I've been teaching ever since. And it's quite possible that I've given 30 Dharma talks on Buddha's Enlightenment Day. But I've never given the same talk. There are elements that will be the same in each talk. And there's a story about the Buddha's Enlightenment that I like that comes from this book by Karen Armstrong, and it's a biography of the Buddha. And um, so I grabbed it today to, to find my familiar story. And out came these two pages, which are notes from previous Dharma talks about Buddha's Enlightenment Day. And then today, I jotted this card down. So now this is the third year. Now, I didn't just, well, I don't know, it's probably about 10 years ago that I discovered this Karen Armstrong book. And as I look over what I've said in the past, some of it is in here and some of it isn't. Today is a new day. It's a new Buddha's Enlightenment Day. It's not even the same Buddha. It's not even the same Enlightenment. From the start, we don't know. And damn, we don't like that. But from the very beginning, we don't know. So we talk about Buddha, and we talk about enlightenment as if we know what we're talking about. Really? Do you? I think really whatever we think about Buddha and enlightenment is a projection of our own narrative. It really has nothing to do with the historical Shakyamuni who became Buddha. I guess he was Gautama who became Buddha. This young boy that was born into a, 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 a royal family. Already from the start, there's something wrong. Because Buddha didn't have a vaginal birth. Buddha, Buddha popped out, I think, out of his mother's hip. Really? What planet is he on? Who is this Buddha? So, and then the story goes, he walked seven steps in various directions. He pointed to the sky, and he pointed to the, or touched the ground, and he said, in the heavens above and the ground below, only I am holy after he popped out of his mother's hip. How many infants do you know who could do that? Not only did he have already a well-formed, complex ability to speak, but he could walk too. And he already had some knowledge. What planet was that? So whose Buddha are we really talking about? This is really important. Because unless we challenge all the assumptions from the very beginning, we're just living in the fantasy world that our Buddhist pro practice is meant to open up. The word Buddha means awake. So the story goes, he awakened from his delusion. You hear I said, his delusion. Really? What is a he? That's a man-made word. There's no he in nature. There are animals with different anatomical construction. But he, she, enlightened, not enlightened, are all human creations. We make it, and then we believe it's true. And then if you follow the 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 dial the political dialogue or the social dialogue at least here in America we start fighting about it my way is the right way no 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 you're wrong my way is the right way and nobody really knows but nobody is comfortable with that not knowing so we create fantasies we create a lot of pain and suffering in our own minds and heart because we struggle to be with not knowing. 
So enlightenment isn't what you think it is. But then there's a problem because we get these ideas of enlightenment and then we think we have this practice that is going to lead us to our idea of enlightenment. But we're in the house of mirrors of our own narrative. We posit truth, we say we're not there, but we have this practice that will bring us to something that we made up. If Buddha was awake, he didn't wake up to another fantasy. The story at least goes that, boom, he woke up to not knowing. He woke up to clear seeing, clear perception, not limited by his fantasies and ideas and beliefs. You know, earlier tonight before the talk started, I was looking at my little square, and I guess what happened is I realized I needed to get my headset. And I thought, well, if I stand up, you're going to actually see what's behind me. But most of you have never seen what's behind me. And then I realized, you're looking at this little square, maybe I'm on speaker view, so I'm a bigger square. But you have no idea what's outside the frame. You just don't know. You don't know about the pile of papers that I have up on this shelf. You don't know about all the books. You don't know about the, the thing, the, what color my ceiling is. You don't know really that there's a window over there or that there are doors over there. You don't know the size of this space. You don't know what kind of floor I'm sitting on. You really don't have any idea about what's below right here. I might not have any pants on at all. You would never know. But yet you th we act as if we know. And we, our brains are wired this way. It's nobody's fault. We take a few bits of data and our brains, our consciousness is set up to create a full, clear, solid image. But the image itself is made up. It's not true. And if Buddhism is about anything, it's about pursuit of truth. But that's a word. We don't even know what we're looking for. This is really important because in our kind of practice, this deep, deep not knowing is the starting point of practice. And it's the end point of practice. We're not waking up, oh, now I get it. We wake up to the fact that we don't know. And we practice to bring our presence, our awareness, and our aliveness to this moment to be able to clearly see, smell, taste, touch, and think. But we'll never really know, or maybe we will, but I just don't know yet. That's also a possibility. But we will, I at least, can't tell you the absolute truth. And likely, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me anyway. Because unless we find it for ourselves, it's just another abstract co concept. So the beauty of even the idea of Buddha's enlightenment is that it wakes us up. It's the Chinese kats. Ha! It's the idea that blows our minds. Our tendency is want our minds to be centered, calm, peaceful, and knowledgeable. But if you're a real practitioner of Zen, the rug is being pulled out from under you every day. And not only is the rug being pulled out from under you, but you're complicit in that pulling of the rug out. You're actually doing it on purpose. Because we, if you get a little bit of insight, you realize that unless you keep challenging your assumptions and beliefs, you're going to fall back asleep. So 
we do a funny thing at a Zen center. We try to create a safe space to practice. Everybody is welcome in the fullness of our diversity. But actually, a Zen center is not a safe place at all because we're constantly having our ideas, beliefs, and assumptions challenged. And if you live residentially in a Zen center, the challenges are really ongoing every day. So there's a real importance to having a safe space where everyone is included. Because none of us really know. But don't come here thinking that your practice of Zen will be comforting and soft. We're a very soft community. And I'm pretty much a soft teacher. I don't like to tell people what to do. I don't even really like to criticize people. I have plenty of critical thoughts. But I don't like it. It's not my way. But I don't need to do it. Because you're all criticizing yourself all the time every day. Become aware of it. And when I say you all, I'm really not taking myself out of the picture. I'm just leaving myself out only in that I don't have to do it to you. You're already doing it. And actually, our criticism and self-judgment does nothing but get in the way. We need to have some confidence. And maybe one of the things that I get from this myth of the Buddha's enlightenment is a sense of confidence in not knowing. When we give meditation instructions, we talk about finding that place in your lower abdomen, your don't know center, your tanjen, energy garden. An energy garden, it's like a bubbling cauldron, just like the universe is a bubbling cauldron. We get these photographs from the, the Webb telescope. There's all this stuff going on. There are places in our galaxies where new stars are being born. Old stars are dying. And all the substance of matter and energy that, that give us life is being recycled and composted and changed all the time. But our minds want to lock it in place. It's binary. It either is or it isn't. To be a little bit provocative, we humans think climate change is a terrible thing. And of course, there's so much suffering that will arise out of the changes that are happening. And we even blame ourselves for what we've done to the planet that created it. I share that narrative. But is it really true? Is it really bad? If scientists tell us as they've been studying life on planet Earth, it's been changing. It never stops changing. I've used this line before. Let's see if I could get it. There's a line from a Paul Simon song that I like quite a lot. And it's about this kind of change that's always happening. And he said, first, it was an ocean. Now it's a mountain range. Now I'm going to forget the lyric. Everything is in motion. Everything is different, but nothing has changed. This climate change that we, we've, we're so fearful of, is only another part of this change. If we were a dinosaur, the day that that, if this story is even true, but the day that that, what was it, an asteroid or some big meteorite hit this planet, created this intense reaction, and likely much of, of life died in a moment. On a small scale, we had this 
America dropped this atomic bomb on Japan and hundreds of thousands or at least 100,000 lives in an instant were gone. Now the beginning of August comes and goes and we barely remember. What we're left remembering is the horror of dropping that bomb. And for about 70 years or so, that horror has been pretty good at keeping us away from using it. But my fear, honestly, is we're getting farther and farther away from the memory. And it might be becoming more likely that somebody's going to use it. That's what human beings do. So this moment of changing climate, most likely in, in my lifetime and maybe most of yours, we're going to be faced with, with unusual, unpredictable, and extreme changes of weather. Within the, the variety of change, you know, here in California, part of our struggle is lack of water. If there's a year with an odd amount of rain, as long as it's not too much, we're going to like it. So maybe, and if you're a Russian in the tundra of Siberia, climate change may end up to be the best thing that ever happened to you. Because suddenly the land that you've been eking out an existence on, existence on is going to become more fertile. There's going to be a longer growth, uh, what's it called, growing season. And you're going to get richer because all those people to the south are going to be becoming poorer. So what's good for you might not be so good for someone else. That's the way the universe works. We don't like it. It's not fair. And it feels bad. But that's the world we live in. So what does this now have to do with Buddha's Enlightenment Day? The Buddha had to deal with all of this. I grapple with the story of the Buddha's birth and enlightenment because there's so much things, there are so many parts of it that aren't really possible. But part of the myth that really troubles me, let alone, I just got through the fact that he jumped out of his mother's hip when he was born and he could walk and he could talk. But leaving that aside, the story goes that his father was given a prophecy upon his birth. And in the prophecy, he, they, he was told either his son was going to become a great king or a great religious figure. His father really didn't want him to become a great religious figure. He really wanted him to be the king. So he must have hatched this plan. If I don't give him any stimuli that will cultivate a spiritual or a religious sensibility, maybe he'll grow up to be this great king that I want him to be. So the story goes that the fa his father hid from him the fact that people get sick, people get old, people die, and people are poor. Now, if you think about it, to hide old age and sickness when you have all these servants around the palace is very difficult. So you can imagine there were high walls on the palace grounds, and it wasn't so easy for this young boy and then young man to get out. But first of all, his mother died 10 days or seven days after he was born. Already, he has to know something about death. It was his aunt who raised him. So already, whether he consciously knew it or not, this young boy already suffered. He already had the experience of pain and suffering. 
Excuse me, I just need to mute somebody. Um, that's our life. But the story doesn't account for that. So how many, how many servants needed to be fired every year? Because I don't know about you, but every year I look a little bit older. You know, there's a bunch of years we get away with pretending we don't. But, you know, look at pictures over the years. That's what happened. So he had to fire people. But maybe this young boy loved the person he was fired, who got fired. So in some ways, he had to be trained not to care about anybody or anything else other than himself. And that may be the fundamental point, that Buddha was trained to be self-centered. Buddha was trained as a human being to lack compassion, to lack empathy, and to only be concerned about his pleasure and his well-being. I don't know about you, but as I'm saying it, that doesn't seem to be a good recipe for a king either. I don't think I'd want to be ruled by somebody who had no compassion, no empathy, and cared only for themselves. Pardon the um, little side political statement, but I think we've already lived through that once. I don't think, I know for myself, I don't want to live through it again. So, this is all preposterous. But there's a, there's a piece in the story that, that Karen Armstrong talks about that I like quite a bit. And I'm skipping forward a little bit to go backwards, but just not to miss the point that I, I need to make. At some point, as a, as a uh, um, I guess he was in his late 20s already, if I've got the timing right, the Buddha got an inkling that he's been lied to his whole life, that he didn't have any idea what life was about. So he jumped over the palace walls and he had a few nights where he discovered death. He discovered sickness. He discovered poverty. He saw the suffering of the world and he saw a mendicant. He saw somebody who was trying to heal the wounds of the world, who was trying to understand themselves and find a way to get more comfortable or, or find balance in this world of not knowing. And those four things changed him. You know how we sometimes make a joke about the reform smoker? Maybe these days there are less smokers, so we don't hear about it. As I was growing up, I was the usual teenager who started smoking cigarettes, and it was such a powerful, exciting adventure to do something bad and wrong, and the thrill of the doing of it, and the nicotine, and it was just great. But then most of us, myself included, realize, yeah, this may feel great, but it's also killing you. So we stop. And then we talk about the reform smoker who goes on the bandwagon and starts telling everybody what they should do. The Buddha didn't quite do that. He went off into the countryside. And really, he was following the traditions of the time. There was a movement at that time to go off into the countryside, to do yogic practices, to do meditation practices, to find enlightenment. And the story goes, he tried what everybody was doing. And the story is he was really good at all of them, all the practices. He would rise right to the top, but it never answered his question. So I guess here I'd like to say, we hear even at Empty Gate, we offer you practices. Do those practices and follow your way. Don't stay in the box. 
let these practices show you the way. Experiment. Be willing to make mistakes. Be wrong. There's a lovely line in, in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Suzuki Roshi says, if you're practicing Zen, even if you go three miles in the wrong direction, there's no mistake. Compost your experience. Use everything in your journey to awakening. Don't leave anything out. So there's a story that you know by now I botch up some of these stories. So I'm going to tell it as best I can rather than reading it to you. But the Buddha was getting a bit despairing. He had tried all these practices. Nothing was working. In those days, the belief was you almost had to kill the body to allow the spiritual light to emerge. So you may have seen the, um, the, the paintings or the statues of the Buddha where you can see his ribs. Everything is just, he's completely skin and bones. He was doing that practice of trying to kill the body, almost, because of course, if you succeed, you're done. Even that wasn't working for him. And the story goes, he remembered this experience that he had when he was about six years old. It was the fall festival. And in the fall festival, of course, it's an agricultural community. It's all about harvesting and plowing the fields. Apparently, the whole community went out, all the men in the village. Of course, we were in a sexist time. Not that we're so much in not a sexist time today, but at least the gradations have gotten better. Um, and he was left with, he was left in this field under an apple tree with some nurses who were taking care of him. And the way the story goes, the nurses got swept up into the pageantry of the celebration, and they went off and they left this young six-year-old alone. And because his father was so afraid of the way he was going to grow up, he was never left alone. Imagine that, being so restricted because they don't want you to know what the truth is that you're never by yourself. So you never have a chance to look somewhere that might give you some information. But in this fluke of a moment, he was left alone. And the way the story goes is he was sitting there and he spontaneously moved into jhana practice and he was overcome with this joy and this peace. And the way the story goes is in remembering that feeling, he realized that killing the body and turning against himself may not be the full path. And if I'm getting it right, that's when he decided to have a drink of milk from the milkmaid who was walking by. And all his Dharma friends left him because he broke all the precepts. But out of that breaking the precepts, something shifted. And through a tumultuous night of dealing with all of his illusion and all of his struggles, he was able to come out of that dark night of the soul awakened. And out of that experience, came the Eightfold Path. Now, it's a funny thing because out of the, the Eightfold Path was his realization, but it also wasn't his style of practicing. He didn't use the Eightfold Path to attain enlightenment. He's offered it now to others because he realized the way forward. And what's always curious to me is that the first of the Eightfold Path is right view. Now remember, his view was so tainted by what his father wanted him to believe that he was complete, his viewpoint was completely obscure, 
me say this more clearly. The truth of the moment was obscured from his view because to see the truth would have been the death of his father's desire for him. Every, each one of us has a different father, a different mother, but all of our parents do that to some degree. And those of you who are parents, you're probably doing that to your children. It can't be helped. Socialization is necessary. We have to find a way to live in our society. But in order to do that, we sacrifice something. I was a teenager in radical times. And by the time I was in high school, I thought the whole education system was complete bullshit. All it was was a means to control people. Now, I've grown up a little bit from that view, but I still have some of it. It's like society by ne it's necess necessary for society to indoctrinate us. We need to be socialized. But there's something lost in that socialization practice. And many of us spend the rest of our lives trying to recover what was lost. Maybe that's what enlightenment is, just the recovery of what was lost. In some ways, you know, we say that Buddha is a very shorthanded way of saying this, that the Buddha's enlightenment was was about being able to perceive truth, waking up. Maybe what we, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting this wrong. That Buddha's enlightenment was that he and the whole universe were the same thing. And that was true not only for the Buddha, but for everything and everyone within the universe. So those stars that I was talking about that are being born in the nebula, and the death of those stars and the clouds of cosmic dust that are blowing through the universe, through the, they're us. Our awakening is recovering what we already are. And it is really curious to me that the first and most important part of the Eightfold Path becomes right view. And I've seen it written that right view actually means no view, no one perception. Each moment awakens us to the truth. If we think that this moment, the truth of this moment is going to be the truth of the next moment, we're already trying to stop the motion of the universe. Everything is changing. Everything is in flux. That's the wisdom of impermanence. If the change changes to something we like, we think impermanence is great. But as we get closer to that sickness and death, we're not so sure anymore how great impermanence is. When we lose what we want, we don't like it. When, when the change opens a door that adds value to our lives, we think it's great. Mind makes everything. The fruition of our Buddhist practice is to let go of our, the makings of our mind and to have right view, to be able to see this moment clearly. And again, I've seen it written that if one attains right view, all the rest of the Eightfold Path will take care of itself. If you pay attention to right view, you don't have to worry about all the rest. And I'm going to have to stop. I could probably, surprisingly, I didn't think I had that much to say. Silly me. But uh, I, I just reminded myself of something, and I'll just say it to end. The very first seven-day uh, retreat I ever did was with a Japanese Zen master named Soen Roshi. Wonderful, wild, unpredictable um, Zen master. It's no surprise that I went from him to Zen master Sun San. There was a real affinity. 
But at one point he said to us, he was talking about koan practice, and he said, if you can really deeply get the mukong on, that's the first koan. He said, once you get that, just bring a paper and pencil to my room and I'll write down everything else. Everything else is just clarifying the basic point. And that basic point is where we started, not knowing. Everything we talk about as a Zen teacher, as a Zen student, is about not knowing, is shaking up the cage. So we're a little bit more confused and in a funny way, a little bit more insecure. But that an insecurity is contained by the depth of our Tanjang, by the deep practice of taking our breath and bringing it down into our Tanjang, into our lower abdomen. That our lower abdomen, our energy garden, is our true nature. That bubbling cauldron that can take any shape at any moment, at any time, is our true self. So we don't have to know it. We become one with it. So the very simple, basic instruction, breathing deeply into our lower abdomen, breathing out, not knowing from our lower abdomen, is the deepest, most important practice. So don't worry about learning the particularities. Don't think you're going to get some secret practice at the end that's going to solve the question. It's already given to you at the very beginning. All you have to do is wholeheartedly, with curiosity, effort, and faith, do it. That's the Buddha's enlightenment. That's the legacy of the Buddha. The Buddha put himself through so many difficult things that we probably could only fantasize about and very likely would never be willing to do ourselves. And so many of the teachers who did that style of practice come back and say, you don't have to do it. Just keep don't know. Stay in your tanjan, in your center. Open your heart. Move away from self-centeredness. Move towards embracing, helping others and you'll find your way. So I hope we all do that together because it is a bitch to do it by ourselves. It's too hard. We have a, retreat, a one day retreat coming up on Saturday and everybody says at the end of these retreats, I would never do it unless the rest of you were here. How many of us just decide on our own to take a Saturday and to sit eight periods of meditation. How many of us do that? And yet many of us on this screen today will join with others over and over and over again to do just that because we've had a taste. We know it's difficult. We may not even like it, but there's something that opens us. There's something that gets revealed as we drop out of the narrative and into our center. 